Believers, we're so excited on this upcoming weekend. We will be observing on Sunday, May the 3rd, our second annual communion. We're excited in this season. We're not waiting to come back into our physical building. We're going to have our second, this is historical for the city of joy, virtual communion. So that means that those persons who support us and you're with us and city of joy, we're encouraging you this week. If you can go out to the grocery store, if you're not in our immediate area and you can grab some juice, grab some crackers. And on this Sunday after I minister, we will partake in the Lord's Supper together. To all of the City of Joy Nation that is local in the DMV, we want to let you know that on this Saturday, the 2nd of May, from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. at the City of Joy campus, we will be distributing pre-packaged communion kits. We will have a drive through for you to pick up pre-packaged communion kits. Deacons will be there to receive you so that you can receive it. Remember, we are following the laws of the land. Our awesome Governor Hogan is leading us through this process. And so when you come, you need to have your PPP on, PPE on. They're going to extend to you the communion kit of what you need, and you're going to receive one anointed oil that has been consecrated for over 40 days. And you're going to anoint your front door, your back door, anoint yourself and the rooms in your house. So we look forward, believers of the City of Joy, of seeing you not only Saturday for those picking up your prepackaged communion kits, but all of our persons who connect with our church on our virtual communion on YouTube and Facebook as we lift up the name of God through eating his body and drinking his blood. Be blessed. Welcome to all of our awesome members of the City of Joy, to the City of Joy Nation, to all of our online viewers, to the friends of our amazing members. We're excited. This is Pastor T, and we're excited about getting prepared to go into the word from the Lord. Will you grab your paper, your pad, your iPad, Call your friends down to be around your, your TV as we prepare to go in this awesome study because God has an amazing teaching for us on today. Let's start with prayer. God, we love you. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your great people. Bless us as we go into your word to learn of you. Teach us your principles that we can be the disciples that you need in this day and time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Even at home, say amen. I'm excited to not only have you today, but to go further in our study. We have just completed uh, the first phase of discipleship, which is the teaching that specified uh, the focus on the mission of being a disciple. Now, today we're starting the new series or section of the teachings that deals with the call of being a disciple, the call, write that down on your paper, on your pad. If you're just joining with us for the first time, I would encourage you in your own time and leisure, go back over the teachings that we've dealt with thus far that, uh, that will help you to understand where we are. We covered a lot of things as we go into our teaching today. I'm teaching brick upon brick, precept upon precept. So it's going to get tighter. It's going to get not tougher, but you're going to get a lot more information because we're growing in discipleship, but you need those prior courses. Okay. Let's um, talk about a couple of things we need to do. We do a memory verse. We call it MV. So write down on your pad, your MV for this upcoming week. It is found in Romans. We're still in Romans. You probably read more in Romans now than you've ever read in your life, but guess what? It's all all good. Your scripture this week is Romans 11 verse 27. And listen what it says in the NIV. And this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. And this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. I get excited about that because that's the reason why we say that's your memory verse over the next seven days. Every day recite that verse. Okay. And as a disciple, our scripture reading 
for the next five days. We read 10 scriptures a day. We're in Acts chapter 7 between verses 15 and 18. We're going to make it through the book of Acts. And um, I got a couple of texts from some of my Bible students, and they were sharing with me that there are apps now that even if you don't read, they will read the verses to you. So however you get it, as long as you get it, I'm excited because you're still getting the word of God. OK, so I need you to stick with me. If you're a disciple, I should be able to give you greater levels of assignment. Each round goes a little bit higher. I can put a little bit more on you. Um, and so I need you to stick with me today. We're starting the teachings that deals with the call of being a disciple. And we're going to start with uh, St. John chapter one, verse 35. I'm going to be reading quite a number of verses and you're going to be blessed because we've completed the teaching of the mission of the disciples. Now we're going to look at the call of being a disciple. Chapter one, verse 35. The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples and he saw Jesus passing by. He said, look, the Lamb of God. Highlight that Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him say this. They followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, what do you want? They said, Rabbi. Highlight the word Rabbi, which means teacher. Where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying and spent that day with him. It was about the 10th hour. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who had heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah. Highlight the word Messiah. That is the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which when translated is Peter. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Now, as we start to deal with the call of disciples, I, I need to share with you that this is a section that is going to challenge you. It's going to challenge you. We finished the mission. Now we're dealing with the call. Somebody say the call. So the first thing that I need for you to understand when we start to deal with the call of the disciple, every person who's saved should be moving from church membership to church discipleship for Jesus Christ. Because the Bible says that he commanded us to make disciples. That's a part of the Great Commission. And he never intended for church members to change the world. Not in scripture. He intended for disciples to change the world. So in order to change the world for Christ, you have to understand the call. Understand the call. So when you're called, there are three things you need to do. And I need you to write these down. The first thing you have to do when you deal with the call, you have to accept the assignment. Accept the assignment, right? That you got to accept the assignment. When, when God calls you to do stuff, it, even though he calls you until you accept it, you're not going to move forward. You're not going to come into fruition and the things that he's placed in you won't be manifested. The first thing you have to do is to accept the assignment. After you accept the assignment, the second thing you have to do disciples, and I'm talking to you as disciples, you have to embrace the assignment, embrace the assignment. Now, when you hear the word embrace, that simply means that when you have that calling on your life, you and your assignment has to become one. It has to be a merger. You've accepted it. Now you are becoming the assignment. Okay. And then the third thing that you have to do, you have to excel in the assignment. But there's no excelling until you first accept it. And then you have to embrace it. You've been called to preach. Well, you got to accept it. Then you got to embrace it. And then you have to start working to, to learn and to show yourself approved and develop and get in the posture so you can grow. Uh, you've been called to prophetically speak. And this is a day and time where we need more prophetic voices. Because this is a time where 
uh, the government is going to really see the need where they have to listen to the prophetic. Like in the Bible days, there was always a prophetic voice before something happened, not just when something happened, but a prophetic voice that, that even in the Bible, that leadership would start listening to, to be in preparation. And so, so as a disciple, you need to do those three things, write those three things down, and you have to understand it as we get deeper into it. Now, what I read to you in just a few short verses, it shares with us some things about Jesus Christ. And the question that you have to answer as a real disciple, who is Jesus? Then who is Jesus to you? OK, let's look back at verse 35. And the next day, John was there again with two of his disciples when he saw Jesus passing by. He saw Jesus, but he said, look, the lamb of God in this passage of scripture, as Jesus is connecting and calling disciples you find Jesus is recognized by disciples through different names. The same Jesus, but he's called so many different names that we're going to look at and expose. And each name that we find of Jesus in this particular passage, it gives him a different title, but it talks about a different feature, a different aspect of who he is. Let's look at one. Um, it says in verse 36, when he saw Jesus passing by, he looked and called him what? The Lamb of God. You highlighted that. Then you see in verse 38, it says they said rabbi. Highlight the word rabbi. And the definition for rabbi you find in the word, it means teacher. So somebody called him a teacher, a spiritual teacher. But then John calls him a Lamb of God. Write that down on your sheet of paper. So when John calls Jesus a lamb of God, he recognized Jesus as the sacrificial lamb for the whole world. So when you think about a lamb, what do you think about? You think about an animal that is not only innocent, but patiently endures what they're dealing with. So when John saw Jesus, he said, wait a minute. He's the lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. First Peter chapter one, verse 19. I want you to turn there because um, I want to show you something. Verse 19 of first Peter. And we're going to work the word of God. I need you to stick with me. If I go too fast, just put me on pause, write it down and you come back. But I'm going to teach you because you're strong disciples learning the things of God. Verse 19 of first Peter. But with the precious blood of Christ, listen what first Peter says, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him, you believe in God who raised him from the dead and glorified him. And so your faith and hope are in God. First Peter calls him what? A lamb. Now, go back to John chapter 1. Let's look at verse 29. Because I want you to start seeing Jesus. Verse, verse 29 of for the first chapter. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of what? The world. Highlight sin of the world and highlight Lamb of God. So when John saw him, John summarized when he looked at Jesus, the greatest work that Jesus would do when he was walking here on earth. The greatest thing that Jesus would do was not open up blinded eyes. It was not make a man who was deaf to hear. It was not making somebody who would dumb to talk. The greatest thing that he would do, listen to this good, would be to take the sin of the world to Calvary's cross for the plan of redemption. So John, when he looks and looks at Jesus, guess what he does? He calls him by his calling. He says, I know you're here in human flesh, but I'm, I, I see beyond that. You came to this world to take all of our sins to the cross. And this is the important disciple. When you are called, 
People should be able to see the calling on your life. You should not have this calling and you operate and your calling is secret. People should see the calling. If you're a deacon and, uh, and we're in the midst of a pandemic now, you don't stop becoming a deacon because the physical building is not open. They should see the calling of being a deacon function while you're away from the physical building. If you're called to minister, and no, you, you're not able to go in because of social distancing. People should still see the calling on your life because there's more ways to minister than one way. <laughs> you need to write that down. There's more ways. And, and, and that's the problem is that you, you got to understand the message is still the same, but the methods have changed, but the word still goes forth. If you are a deaconess and you care for people and you pour into young women, just because they're not able to come to a building, you can still minister. You can minister. If you got a cell phone, you should be encouraging 10 people a day. If you call, you should find a way to reach out and talk to people. You don't have to talk to them all day long, but pouring a word of encouragement in the midst of a time where some are considered hopeless and suicides are going up and uh, unemployment lines are getting longer and people are becoming more uh, hopeless and despairing uh, in this type of time. That's ministry. But the problem is when people see you, do they see your calling or do they just see Diane? Because what the church has to do in this time, the church should not stand down. Glory to God. The church has to stand up to show that a building does not stop the flow of ministry in this day and time, the kingdom of God will continually expand. Souls are still going to be saved. Matter of fact, this day and time will be an outpouring of a latter rain in the midst of everything that's going on. But people have to see, and you'll see the people who are called because people who are called don't stop. People who are called are relentless about the work that God had committed to their hands. Matter of fact, Ecclesiastes 9 around verse 10 says, whatever I've given your hands to do, you have to do it because once you go into the grave, you can't do anything. So you got to work, Jesus says, while it's day, because when night cometh, what? No man can work. So when Jesus uh, was moving around, John saw him. John said, wait a minute. You are the lamb of God. And I want to encourage you as a disciple, when a person see you, they should not focus on your attitude. They should not focus on you being sometimey. Well, you know, that person is good sometimes. Then they're not. They, 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 they call and check on me, but then they don't know. They need to see your call. Because when they see your call, they see Jesus flowing in your life. So Jesus is the lamb before we read it in 1 Peter, the foundation of the world. Jesus was actually seen, whether you know it or not, in the Garden of Eden. He was right there. When Adam and Eve sinned and they recognized their nakedness, guess what happened? They had to clothe themselves with animals, skin. In order for them to clothe themselves with the animal skin, an animal had to be slain, <laughs> which means blood had to be shed. That blood that was shed to cover them was actually the Lamb of God. The Lamb was, was visible even in Genesis when Abraham was told to go and sacrifice his son. He had an altar prepared, but the altar was prepared. He proved his faith, and God had already caught something that would be sacrificed. That was the Lamb of God. We preached about it, I think, about two weeks ago. The Lamb was seen in Exodus, down in the children of Israel. We call it Passover. And the Passover is simply about a Lamb not only uh, being crucified, but that the blood would be placed over the door. That was a replication of the Lamb of God. How do we know it? In the Passover. Guess what Jesus says? He tells his disciples, take this bread. This bread represents what? My body. That's the lamb. Then he says, take the cup. Drink of the cup. 
The cup represents what? My blood. That's the perfect lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the whole world. So now notice this in John. He says, take away the sin, S-I-N. Write that down on a piece of paper. So when he says sin, not sins, there were so many sins. There were sins of, 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 of lying, of backbiting, of gambling, of of, of, of whoremonging, there, there, there were sins of pride, there were sins of jealousy. So what John said, and he saw this through the spirit because John was a spiritual man. He was not caught up in what it looked like. He, he said that Jesus came as the lamb of God, listen to this, to take away the sin of the world, which mean that John saw God putting together all of the sins of the world into one bag. That one dark, ugly bag of all of the sins had come together to be one sin. Then he put the sin on the back of the lamb. And when the lamb goes to Calvary's cross, he takes away all of our sins. Because all of the sins were combined into one and Jesus Christ took that to the cross and got redemption for mankind. That's very, very important. Look at verse uh, 34. I'm still in chapter one of John. Verse 34 says, uh, I have seen and I testify that this is the son of God. I like the word son of God. What does son of God mean, Pastor T? This is the one who perfectly declares the nature and the personality of God, the father. He's the son of God. So that means that not only is he walking around in flesh, but this is somebody who walks around in flesh, but who is co-equal to God. He's co-eternal to God. He's the son, as you know, not of Joseph, he's the stepson of Joseph, but he's the original son of a eternal father. So it was something about Jesus that could never be explained in human terms because there was more to him than what met the eye. And can I suggest to you as a disciple, there is more to you than what meets the eye. More to you. So when you hear the word son, son of God, he says, no, I'm not looking at you as Moses. Uh, I mean, as Mary's son, as Joseph's son. When I see you, I see that you are the son of God. Look at verse number 40 of chapter one. We're looking at the names of those who've been called. Andrew, Simon, Peter's brother was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him. Listen what he says. We have found the Messiah. And what is the Messiah, pastor? He's the long expected savior of Israel. Okay. And the world. He's the long expected savior. So he calls him the Messiah. Okay. And then we stumble upon, look at verse 51, same chapter. Then he added, I tell you the truth, you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the son of man. Highlight the word son of man. And for those of you who are serious Bible students, the son of man was the greatest way that Jesus referred to himself. In fact, in the Hebrew, he uses the son of man in the New Testament 81 times. And 30 of those times are in the book of Matthew alone. So what does the son of man represent? It represents his humanity. By using this term, he was declaring himself to be a part of mankind. He was a part of of mankind. He had human flesh. That's why the Old Testament calls him a kinsman redeemer. He was a kinsman redeemer because he was a part of humankind. He was kin to us. 
He was human just like you and me. So somebody said, well, Jesus wasn't human. Jesus was human. If you pinched him, you would see a mark on his skin. Can you imagine that? Jesus was human. He had eyes just like you and me. He had feet just like you and me. He got tired just like you and me. Okay. So what is the idea behind that saying he's the son of man? The idea in the phrase is not to share that he was a perfect man, nor a ideal man, nor even the common man. Instead, it was referring to the fact that he was the son of man who came with a greater focus that was beyond Mary and Joseph. And, and this is going to blow your mind. Daniel in the Old Testament prophesied that he would come and called him the son of man. Go to Daniel chapter seven. Are you sticking with me? I told you we was going to move pretty fast today uh, because we got a lot to cover. You're a disciple, so I don't want to let up. I want to speed up now. Daniel chapter seven. I want to look at verse 13. Write that down. And it says, in my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was one <laughs> like a son of man. I like that. Coming with the clouds of glory. Oh, God, I feel the anointing right there. He approached the ancient of days and was led into his presence. Verse 14, he was given authority. Somebody say authority. Write that word authority down and highlight it. He was given glory and sovereign power. All peoples, nations, men of every language worshipped him. Good God. Oh, disciples, you ought to be shouting while you read this scripture. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Good God, my father. Daniel saw it. Jesus was not a mythical person. Watch this. He wasn't a legend. He wasn't an illusion. He appeared to be human because he was human. And that's why in chapter one of John, they called him the son of man, but it also called him the son of God. Now that's important because you have to recognize he was here. And for 30 years, disciples, he experienced the struggle of humanity. He experienced family. He had brothers and sisters. Did you know that? Um, he had to experience brothers. He had to experience the process. And some of you are going through some things now, and you got to understand deliverance is yours, but you still have to go through a process. You still have to experience some ups. You have to experience some downs. Even in the 23rd Psalm, in the middle of it, I call it the middle passage, it says that uh, he goes through the valley of the what? Sh shadows of death, but he'll fear no evil. So why you go through is nothing to fear. Why? Because God is with you. Okay. Turn to Hebrews chapter two. You're going to need this disciples. Hebrew, Hebrews chapter two. And I pray that you're getting some from the word of God. We used to sing a song years ago, feed me till I want no more. I want you to be fed because you got to work. If you got a calling on your life, you need to feed up. You need to get the word of God in you because there's some assignments that has to start happening at this time. We're not waiting to a pandemic to be over, to minister to people. We're not waiting to spare not and cry loud. We're not waiting to minister to men across the world, women across the world. We're not waiting to go forth in our callings. Your calling is not wait, waiting on the sideline until a pandemic is over. Your calling demands that you function in the capacity of what God has called for you to do, even right now. God and the host of heaven will back you up. Their visions, their visionaries, their gifts from God. And he's not waiting for you to wait until the dust settles. God says in the midst of this season, I want you to go forth doing what I've called you to do. And I'm going to bless. I'm going to bless you and bless people through you, even in a time 
just like this. Hebrews chapter two. Glory be to the name of God. I want to read verse 17. And I believe this is going to really, really, really bless your life. It says 17 of Hebrews chapter two. You with me? For this reason, he had to be made like his brothers in every way. I'm talking about Jesus in order that he might become merciful and a faithful high priest in service to God. And that he might atone for the sins of the people. He says he had to be made like his brother. He had to understand the struggles. And as a disciple, don't become a disciple that can't understand the struggles of your brothers and your sisters. Don't become a person that looks down on somebody because they're going through. Because had it not been for the grace of God, you would be in that very place right now. And so what you got to understand, like Jesus, he had to experience the human side before he, God elevated him to be the faithful high priest. If he's the high priest, which means that he holds a seat to intercede for all of our prayers, don't you think it was important for him to experience the human struggle? And if you're going to impact the world for Jesus, people have to know you can understand. People have to know that you can connect, that, that this is a time of connection. This is a season of connection. You're called, but you're not connecting. Uh, you're gifted, but you're not connecting. You have a lot of wisdom, but you don't connect. What's the purpose of having the great wisdom, but if you can't connect with people? What's the purpose of being so smart if you're not connecting with people so they can understand how to use it? People don't care how much you know. That's right. You know that until they know how much you what you care. All right. Go back to John. Let's go to first John chapter one. First John chapter one. And I hope you love in the word of God. I'm teaching you as a disciple. We picked up the pace a little bit because God is going to minister to you. You say, Pastor, I, I believe there's something for me to do and I, I, I need to wait to get back in church. You don't have to wait to get back to a physical building. The church is the body of Christ. You are the church. And so you can minister right where you are because the gift of God and people should see the calling on your life. If your calling was confined to a building, maybe you have to question your calling. Because God is not confining your calling. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof and they that dwell therein. God wants you to impact people for the kingdom even now. Look at 1 John chapter 1. And I believe this is going to be the last scripture that we're going to get to uh, in this study. The call of the disciple. 1 John chapter 1 verse 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have seen, which we have heard, and which we've seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of what? Of life. This means that when it comes down to Jesus Christ, there were those who saw him. They had to see him operating in the flesh. They had to see the son of man, but then they recognized him as the son of God because he had two callings in his life. And can I suggest to you that you ought to have two callings in your life? Yes, you're human, but there's a divine side on the inside of you. Your calling is not really for in your flesh. Your calling is in your spirit. And God connects to you through the divine nature of what he's placed on the inside. Glory to God. And I'm teaching to somebody right now. You got to understand it. Your spiritual side is far greater than your physical side. That's, that, 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 that's the problem. In one of the verses, it said that, that, that trying to work on the physical side it doesn't profit much. It's not saying that there's something wrong with working out and having your body in a certain place, but, but spend the same equal amount of time developing the spirit nature. Okay? Because when God speaks to you, he's going to speak to you in your spirit. John chapter 4, around verse 23, he says, the father seeketh such true worshipers that will worship him in spirit and in truth. When God gives you revelation, he's going to put it in your spirit. He won't put it on your shoulder. When God gives you something, even in this season, you're in the shower, you, you're at home laying in the bed and you're getting revelations. God told me to tell you, you need to start writing. 
And if you like me, I have, I have so much on my plate, I can't remember when God gives me something, I have to write it down. Just write it down. When God is speaking, before I taught today, he spoke to me early. I had to stop what I was doing and, and write it down so I could have it for the people of God. But he didn't put it in my flesh. It wasn't in my eyeballs or my hands. He put it in my spirit. I had to take it from my spirit to put it on some paper so I could share it with you as the body of Christ today. And you need to understand that he's going to put things in your spirit. You're called, but it's time to get it out your spirit to come through your flesh to be manifested. There's a word in you that God needs to be shared, to advance the kingdom of God. It's down on the inside and you feel it because I feel the anointing right now because God is letting me know that you need to know it's time for you to write this down. This is the season of manifestation in your life, in your ministry, in your family. There's so many businesses that's getting ready to be birthed in the name of Jesus all across this country for the advancement of the kingdom of God. And it's going to start in the spirit. It's a spiritual visionary embryo that's starting to reverberate down within your spirit that you're going to move forward in. And I know there's some struggles. I know there's some struggles. I feel in my spirit that there's an atheist. There's an atheist who's struggling because you finally got to a place where you had a place that you starting to believe God, but you can't tell the people around you because you've been taught and trained that there is no God. But now you're battling. God wants me to tell you, you're going to be an awesome disciple in the kingdom. This this season is going to be filled with voices of people who didn't believe in God before. But through this, you recognize there is a reality in serving a true and a living God. And you can't talk to people because you've been with people who don't believe in his presence, who don't believe in the greatness of who he is, who don't believe in him as being the son of God co-equal, co-powerful, but God wanted me to share with you. He's speaking to you right now in the name of Jesus, and he's going to move in your life in this season with the same commitment that you placed in other things. You're going to transfer that to be committed to the things of God. Glory be to the name of God. This is a season like we've never seen before, and if you're blessed, and I'm a disciple, so I have to talk like this. If you're blessed like me to be in the pandemic, then it must be an opportunity for God to reveal himself to a world that is on their way to hell in a way like we've never revealed himself before through people who are called, glory to God, who's expanding the kingdom through the teachings, the taught word, the expressions of the kingdom, and persons who are dedicated to the cause of Christ. Because I've seen them do too much. He's a healer. He's a deliverer. He can bring liberation. He can bring levels of restoration. I still believe, and I have people right now, they're watching this Bible teaching from a hospital bed because they've been quarantined with IV. I still believe that if you call on the name of Jesus right there in that hospital room, God will start moving. He'll lower your fever. He'll, he, he'll start putting revitalization in your spirit. I still believe. I, I have this radical part of, of my walk with God that some of the things that other people do, I may not necessarily do because I'm led by the spirit of God. That if we can get everybody on your floor in that hospital to start calling Jesus at the same time, something will happen. The doctors will be confounded. And we can get people to start believing in the name of God like they never believed in him before. We will see manifestation in ways like we've never seen before. Even now, the kingdom suffered violence, but the violence take it by what? Take it by force. So listen, I'm going to close, but I'm going to close by telling you this out of John chapter number one. All of this comes out of John chapter number one. John the Baptist testified Jesus is eternal. When he calls him son of God, that means he's eternal. He's uniquely anointed with the Holy Spirit. And John says he is the lamb of God because he is the son of God. Andrew testifies 
that Jesus is the Messiah. You read that? You highlighted that. That means he's the Christ. Philip testifies that Jesus is one prophesied in the Old Testament. That's when Philip said he came out of the law. Nathaniel testified that Jesus is the son of God and the king of Israel. They were all called of God. And they saw the calling of Jesus Christ on his life. Believers, I pray that you've been blessed. We're just starting this particular series dealing with the call of the disciple. Your discipleship is dependent upon you recognizing the call of Jesus first, how he functioned, how he moved, how the Lord utilized him. But those he called had a unique perspective over the calling on his life. I pray that you remember your memory verse. I pray that you read Acts. Remember, you can listen to the Bible. The Bible can read the verses to you. However you do it, as long as you do it, it's all right with me. Until next week, I look forward to seeing you in another Bible study. Go over your notes. Write things down because we're going higher each round. We're going to look at more things. You're going to understand your calling. You're going to be doing some great things in the King of Kings. And I believe God is developing people who's going to take this world in the name of Jesus Christ. Until next week, this is C.A. Thompson, the senior pastor of the City of Joy, signing off. But I want to tell every believer and online viewer, if somebody asks you how you're doing, Please tell them, Nehemiah tells us the joy of the Lord. It is our strength. Be blessed. Believers, we're so excited on this upcoming weekend. We will be observing on Sunday, May the 3rd, our second annual communion. We're excited in this season. We're not waiting to come back into our physical building. We're going to have our second. This is historical for the city of joy, virtual communion. So that means that those persons who support us and you're with us and city of joy, we're encouraging you this week. If you can go out to the grocery store, if you're not in our immediate area and you can grab some juice, grab some crackers. And on this Sunday after I minister, we will partake in the Lord's Supper together. To all of the City of Joy Nation that is local in the DMV, we want to let you know that on this Saturday, the 2nd of May, from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. at the City of Joy campus, we will be distributing 
pre-packaged communion kits. We will have a drive-through for you to pick up pre-packaged communion kits. Deacons will be there to receive you so that you can receive it. Remember, we are following the laws of the land. Our awesome Governor Hogan is leading us through this process. And so when you come, you need to have your PPP on, PPE on. They're going to extend to you the communion kit of what you need, and you're going to receive one anointed oil that has been consecrated for over 40 days. And you're going to anoint your front door, your back door, anoint yourself and the rooms in your house. So we look forward, believers of the City of Joy, of seeing you not only Saturday for those picking up your prepackaged communion kits, but all of our persons who connect with our church on our virtual communion on YouTube and Facebook as we lift up the name of God through eating his body and drinking his blood. Be blessed.